Morning, Lindsay. Our afternoon. Good afternoon. I can't keep the day straight.
Hey, Daniel, you want to make uh, Lindsay and me co-host, please? Thank you, ma'am. All right, welcome folks. I see some people signing in here. This is great. Happy Wednesday. We've posted over in the chat. If uh, so Be sure to sign in in the chat. And then if there's anybody in the room with you, if you could give us their names um, as well, that way we can capture attendance. Thank you for having your camera on, Jessica. We appreciate it. No problem. <laughs> Thanks for having that camera on, Chelsea. OK, Teal. Teal doesn't have a camera on her laptop or on her cam. Yeah. So. You know, we'll let you that that excuse will only work for so long though. So <laughs> I'm trying to get them to get me a better one. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with your audio though. <laughs> Actually, I'm connected on phone because my laptop doesn't have a microphone either. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So it's basically a potato. A pretty potato. <laughs> I can see things. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else who signed on want to turn on your camera for us? Uh, maybe unmute. Make sure that your microphones are working. This is Cindy Cobb. I ordered a camera. It's not in, so I'm not going to be visible again today. Okay. We look forward to seeing you one day. All right. Others, uh, Tanya Haynes, Tanya Adcox. Can you unmute and give us a mic check, please? Maybe turn on your cameras if you have them. I'm here. I don't have a camera. Okay. It's Tanya Haynes. I don't have a camera. Oh, man. Yeah, Gail just told us uh, no camera, no mic for the computer. So she's joining us tag teaming through the phone. Okay. Hey, thanks for joining us, Melissa. And we have Jessica uh, and Ruby from Knott County Health. Thank you all. Sharon Davis and Jeff Stidham. Thank you all for being a part of this. Hi, Amber. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the camera. We appreciate it. We have Cindy Cobb from Kenwood Health. She's already, we know she has audio.
change. Welcome, Tyler. Good to see you. We've got some other folks joining us now. Jennifer Thompson, you wanna, if you can, can you turn on your camera for us? Greg Otter as well. Hi, Amanda. Okay, for those of us who are uh, signing in now, um, you'll notice over in the chat, we've asked that you'll uh, sign in there as well and then let us know who else is in the room with you. That helps us track attendance. So when we do attendance, we look at the chat room, we look at the um, polls that we give, then we also look at the registration. So between the three of those, we hope we do our best to capture everybody's attendance and give you full credit for being here. So Ruth, we have 32 signed on with us. You wanna go ahead and get started then? I think in the interest of time, I uh, seems like these, dis yeah, these discussions on PPE have, uh, they've been running long. Uh, yeah. So yeah. we'll get through the, the pleasantries as quickly as possible. So again, just that general housekeeping stuff, uh, muting your, your microphone. Uh, so be sure to click that unmute when you want to, if you have a question or a comment for our presenters. Uh, if you're having some technical difficulties, drop that in the chat. Uh, we have Lindsay and Daynell, um, our two fabulous coordinators who will monitor that and try to do some troubleshooting for you. So um, at the end of today's session, um, before you log out, be sure to take that poll. That's one of the ways we're going to capture attendance today. Um, again, it's important that we have everybody's participation and that if you give of your time that we note it and document it as being present. So um, Lindsay's email is there. Uh, we'll be sure to post that in the chat. So if you have questions around attendance, um, you can email her directly and she'll be happy to take care of that kind of stuff for you. So there were some things about the Dropbox and the Dropbox invites that we kind of changed up from last week. Anna, would you want to walk through that with them, please? You're on mute. Sorry, I just want to quickly remind you all that um, you are going to send these, you have to receive the calendar invite, supposed to be part of the series, um, where you can uh, then see, you know, this is my time, it's on your calendar. If you want to switch a cohort, if you don't want to be in this specific time cohort, you can always uh, let us know and we can officially switch you to either the Wednesday morning or our um, new one that is going to be Thursday afternoons at two o'clock. So just let us know. Uh, you all are officially cohort five. Um, but if there is a change that needed, you can let me know. Then you also see that there's a Dropbox link in this calendar invite that will take you, if you can go to the next page, uh, next slide. It, it takes you to this document and this document gives you all the sessions, the, the um, topic that we're going to discuss. And then there's going to be these hot links to the MP4 pre-work. Also a link to the PowerPoint after the session. We, we will link, we'll make the, the, the link come alive after the session. And then at the end of the week, any lessons we've learned from all of the nursing homes together, we will put a hot link there that says lesson one, lesson two, et cetera. So this can become, an, and it, it will be every week. So if I update it, you will see it on all your calendar invites. So this will help you to uh, keep track of all of this information in one spot. If you if you have any any questions about that, feel free to email me. No. So you'll get access to the PowerPoints and things through um, that Dropbox link. But we also just want to keep making you aware of the Higher Logic community. Um, another excellent resource because not only does that library have information related to today's specific session, uh, there's also a full library of other documents and resources, especially around PPE. Um, as we go through today, there may be some references to that. So again, be sure to, to visit there, sign in. Um, again, it's just a wonderful resource for all the things that we need. So um, helping build today's presentation was um, Dr. Hudson Grant. Uh, Ruth will be playing the role of Dr. Hudson Grant today. So thank you for doing that. 
Um, and then Lisa Thompson and Susan LaGrange were the ones that guided us through uh, the video that you've had a chance to preview before uh, we met today. So with that being said, let's dive right on into the PPE and some uh, guidance and practical approaches for improved outcomes. Ruth, you wanna go ahead and take it away for us, please? I sure will. Thank you very much. And uh, Hudson is a lot cuter than I am. So those of you that haven't met him yet, uh, you will uh, absolutely fall in love with him. Uh, he has a <laughs> tremendous amount of experience and uh, we've worked together in infection control and uh, in long-term care and uh, you know every place um, patient care action occurs. So I know that uh, you will enjoy interaction with him. So I'm gonna try to fill in for him. So. Uh, as we get started, one of the things that as Hudson and I were looking through all of the content, um, we realized that the content is reflective of how quickly things are moving and how quickly we are learning about um, how we manage this virus. So uh, things that we put together that are, that are great uh, last week, now we're thinking, oh my gosh, there are new things that we need to add. So um, in looking at the, at the content, we have decided that uh, we are, in addition to you uh, reviewing the MP4 information that is provided as part of pre-work, we want to then fast forward into today's reality with each of these situations and really be able to spend time with you to try to identify what are the problems that you are having, what are some of the solutions that you have come up with, uh, what are some additional challenges that you can foresee so we are then learning about um, PPE and COVID-19 uh, as we provide care for today. So I wanna get started then with a couple of questions that, uh, that um, I, I want to, to ask of you. And then we are going to talk about some of these responses together and what this means. So um, everybody, please be, as Dave has mentioned, when you have a, a camera, please make sure that it's turned on because the value of these sessions is if you can be completely present and um, involved as we try to understand this together. So number one, how often do residents wear masks with interacting when interacting with facility personnel? So these are how often do your residents wear masks? Then the second question is, does your facility have a fit testing policy? Now this is fit testing for our, our respirator use. The third question is, does your facility have a policy that restricts personnel from gathering during breaks and meals? We'll talk about why that is important. And then the fourth question is, what type of respirators are currently used in your facility? So in honor of Alex Trebek, we'll all hum silently the theme song to Jeopardy in our minds. I love that guy. Um, a lot of y'all are doing really great with the poll. Um, it looks like maybe another six or seven of you. Um, so if you can go and get those answers in, um, then we'll share those results with everybody um, and then we'll continue on our merry way. Perfect. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at, at what the what the poll shows. There we go. All right, okay. So the first thing that I wanna address, we know that we have guidance from both CDC and the uh, Kentucky Department for Public Health and other states that are saying, we need to make sure that we've got this double layer of protection um, for, for preventing the movement of this pathogen from your respiratory tract to mine. And the way to do this is by making sure that both parties, uh, in every opportunity that is possible, both parties that are interacting need to be wearing respiratory protection. That's part of that universal source control approach. So let me um, get, get me some information, you guys, about uh, the situations when um, residents are unable to wear masks. Um, so I'm particularly interested in those of you that said residents rarely wear masks. Um, tell me a little bit more about this and what the, the difficulties are that you're encountering. 
So I need to hear back from you. So those of you that have answered rarely, make sure that you're off mute. I didn't answer rarely, but I know sometimes we have a hard time with our dementia residents. Okay. You know, keeping the mask on and carrying them in the word. I mean, they don't okay. want to fight you if you put the mask on. Okay, so those patients with dementia, what other issues? Um, I didn't answer on there. I just joined the call. Um, but I will say, like she said, dementia has been a big, I mean, that, that lockdown unit is a big issue for us. Um, but the other issue that we have is, um, and this could, could just be because I'm new to long-term care, um, but we have an issue with kind of the, well, I don't want to wear a mask, so why do I have to? So the fact of us saying, what's important for your health, they feel like we're trying to make them do something and they don't like that. Um, so that's a challenge I face because I am, uh, I'm non-clinical, I'm an HR representative, but I am, you know, quite a bit younger than a lot of the residents here. And the thought of someone telling them they have to do something or they need to do it, of course, is kind of the, well, how do you know what's good for me? You know, you know what I'm saying? That's just kind of what yeah, we run yeah. into. Yeah. So this is kind of a difference between um, dealing with a patient that may not understand and then dealing with a patient that may want may want or need more information. And sometimes um, you may have a person that seems perfectly um, uh, with it, but you know just from the questions or the interaction that you know that that everything's not connecting. So we have to be then aware of how we engage with the patients. So what type of strategies have you developed in your facility that can help address this? So yeah. for example, uh, some people have mentioned um, uh, scripts, scripting developments. Cindy, you, Cobb, you, it looks like you wanted to say something. Our, I'm, I, I don't know if I answered the question appropriately. We um, encourage our residents to stay in their rooms as much as possible at Kenwood. And when they're in the hall, they do tend to wear masks, but we interact with them a lot in their rooms where the resident does not wear masks and we're not asking them to do that. Okay, okay. Is, is so, anybody else doing that is my question. We also encourage uh, residents to stay in their rooms as much as possible. But as you guys know, unfortunately, that is not always, um, they're not always able to on our, on our um, AQU, um, they do stay in their rooms 100% of the day because that is our quarantine unit. But for the rest of our units, if they, like you said, if they leave their room, um, we try to make it mandatory. You know, we're obviously not going to force a mask on them or anything, um, but we try to instill in them that that is very important because we do have an activities director who, you know, does activities with them at safe dis six feet distances apart from each other with a mask on. They're not able to participate in activities if they don't wear a mask. Um, so, I mean, we, we do try to encourage them to stay in their room as much as possible, but, you know, I know that it, I would not like to stay in my room as much as we're having to have them do so, so. Okay. So back to the, the question about should we have residents wearing a mask if the staff are wearing a mask and they are in their own room? So um, the short answer to that is that, yes, that is the recommendation that both, whenever two people are gathered, both should be wearing a, uh, should be wearing a mask. Now um, it is, but bringing up the point, is this a practice that is commonly being done or no? no? No, please don't be afraid to say yes or no. You know, again, this is, you know, what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. What goes on here in our discussion is for us to be open with our sharing. So pretend this is well, Vegas. That is that is not how it's being done in my facility at all. We're we're only asking them to wear their masks outside of their room. So same with same Except with us at Twin Rivers. Yes. Yeah, it, 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 because that's that's it's extremely point. hard. That would Go be ahead. like wearing one in your living room. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the idea is that we're trying to we're trying to do everything we can to prevent transmission during that engagement. So we know that staff are not with the residents 100% of the time, but most of the time when you are going to be engaging with the residents in their room, 
you may be doing something, providing them with something that requires kind of up close and personal contact, whether it's physical care or you're directly interacting with them, perhaps administering medication. So for the protection of the residents, when there are two people together, when you are in the room with them, the, the recommendation is to have both wearing a mask. Now, as soon as you leave the room or as you are leaving the room, then that is certainly the consideration to go ahead and help them remove their mask and put it by the, you know, their, their table or wherever it can be reached again. But the purpose is to, to, do, to double the opportunity of transmission prevention. So, um, because remember, uh, you know, your, your mask is not going to contain all of your respiratory particles. The mask doesn't fit that tightly against your face. So as you exhale, um, and if you are someone who, if you are the one that is, that is ill, um, and even we know that we are testing uh, frequently, but we are still seeing new positives, you know, uh, without uh, uh, expecting it. So if you are an asymptomatic carrier, when you exhale, all of that air, that contaminated air is gonna blow out from around your mask. That is why the person that you are with needs to wear a mask to protect them from you. Just like you are wearing a mask to contain and protect you from the other individual. So this sounds like this is something that, that we probably need to think about how might we enable the residents to wear masks? What might be some, some strategies uh, to enable that. As we continue to see our positivity rates increase, this will become increasingly more important. Now, I was telling the group yesterday that in the clinic that we have where we do, um, we do some public testing, for the last three days, we have had a 30%, three zero, 30% of our tests have been positive. That's greatly increased from what we have seen in the past. So we are definitely, at least in, in the Jefferson County area, we are Jeff definitely in the areas where we're seeing increasing rates. So use this double kind of protection idea. Um, yeah, Bobby in Arizona uh, mentioned an interesting thing that the residents feel like they are suffocating. And that's, I think it's something that we have heard over multiple sessions. So if anybody has some solutions to that, maybe drop those in the chat for them to look at it. There's a way that maybe we can ease that fear or anxiety for the residents. So didn't mean to interrupt Ruth, but just trying to no, this is, watch, the, Dave, watch this the chat is, and do this too. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. We know there's so much, um, you know, there's so much fear that is, that is going on that is driving a lot of this. So yeah, that's excellent. Thanks. Hey, Ruth, cool. Laura. It's Laura Morton here. I, so I'm a, for all of you, I'm a geriatrician and medical director and just, um, I know this is a real struggle. I can see it in my own facilities about how there are some patients who are motivated, who have, some of them even have little signs hanging up that I, please ask me to put on my mask before you come in. So that's something that works for those residents that are, you know, engaged enough and with it to do. Um, but the, the big challenge, and, and if anyone has really creative ideas, um, is with the patients with cognitive impairment, and especially those who are pre-diagnosis. I'm sure you all have patients that you probably have a pretty good idea have some um, dementia, but have not yet been formally diagnosed. And so I think that's a real challenge. And as staff members, we have to be aware of what we can do to try to protect them and protect ourselves. So um, I, I think that that's just a tricky area. And Ruth, if you hear anything, please let us know. We would all yeah. love to have a solution to that problem. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that there are things we know not to do. Like we know that it will not be helpful or well accepted by your resident if you hold, someone was trying holding the mask in their hand and putting it over the face of the resident, I, I would strongly suggest that you not try that, uh, that that does not work well. Um, and would, I would not suggest that, you know, that it, that's kind of an aggressive um, action on the part of the person doing that. It also uh, is putting your hand around someone's face and we don't want your hand around anyone's face because then your hand may be the recipient of virus. And then when you rub your own eye or you adjust your own mask, then you run the risk of, of auto inoculation or contaminating yourself. 
Um, so the more that you can do to enable them to put a mask on themselves, or if you can, if there's a way to make a game out of that, that that if that resonates with the with the resident, then um, then uh, again, uh, trying those strategies. But the idea is again protection. All right, what about fit testing? This is a uh, um, something that we've heard a lot about. Uh, the enabling to enabling people to have um, respirators that are capable of passing fit testing. So, um, thirty eight percent of you do that fit testing in house. Some by a contract service. Uh, some have a policy in place, but um, fit testing is not done. I'm assuming that you're not doing fit testing because uh, you have predominantly the KN95 respirators that are, are very difficult to fit test um, and others that have no policy. <clears throat> in, the, in the event, you know, part of our, our current um, OSHA requirement is that if we are using respirators, um, it is required that we have a respiratory protection plan and that we have a fit testing process in place. In talking with other groups, I think we've identified this as something that we can, that we need to put together and provide back um, uh, to groups. And this may be some examples of a respiratory protection plan and a, a toolkit that will contain a number of, of pieces of information for you. I understand that, um, that each state has received um, funding from NACHO, that is the National Association of City and County Health Officials, um, aimed at helping public health provide some type of assistance with long-term care facilities uh, for fit testing procedures. I think how each state chooses to enact that is a little bit different. In, um, in Kentucky, and I know Jefferson County uh, re has received some funding to enable um, the provision of fit testing equipment for long-term care facilities. So I'm trying to find out more about that and we should hopefully have something in that we will be able to take back and. I think that that probably the best way to address this um, would be to go back through the medical directors of those facilities. Do you think, uh, Dr. Morton, will that be, you think, uh, an ideal way to approach this? I think that's a really great start. It's exciting to hear that uh, because it's been an ongoing issue, as I'm sure you all know, trying to get those kits for the fit testing. I know one of my facilities have has finally gotten some, so they're really excited, but it's been an ongoing struggle. All right, so I think what we'll do as part of this toolkit, we'll put information together and then um, we'll, we'll look at hosting a train the trainer uh, program. So Laura B, I think this is one of these QI initiatives that based upon what we have found that, uh, that people are in need of this. So uh, getting a respiratory protection toolkit developed and then making available for all of the, um, the uh, cohorts so Dr. Fall, we'll try to pull that together and then make sure that's um, available. That might be an opportunity for um, Pam, Dr. Yankilov to look at, you know, is there some type of, do we need to get kind of before after impact of, uh, of making that available just to help kind of um, have some, some demonstration of the impact of, of these uh, initiatives. So we'll, we will work on that. Is there anything that we need to know from you about your fit testing um, uh, policies or what you need to have in place? Anything, uh, information we need to get from you that will make um, a respiratory protection toolkit more valuable to you? I am, I've been trying to, we have borrowed equipment from our health department to do fit testing in my facility. This is Cindy from Kenwood. And we use the KN95 respirators. Um, every single person that I have attempted to do the fit test on has failed the fit test, every single one. Yeah. Yeah, you will not be able to pass fit testing with the KN95. Um, the, the, issue with that is many of the KN95s are counterfeit. Um, they are, and they, they are meeting uh, different expectations than what we require in the United States. So 
let me, a, 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 an N95 respirator is designed to be tightly fitting against your face. So it filters out 95% of all of those submicron sized particles. In order to do that, and I'm trying to, I've got, I think I've got a couple that I put close by me so that I can kind of demonstrate. Let me see if I can, all right. The, the straps of these are supposed to fit so tightly so that one goes at the top of your head and it pulls the respirator very closely against your face. The one on the bottom is designed to go in the back of your head so the, it pulls then the bottom of your respirator close to your face. This is why we all took uh, geometry in, uh, uh, in uh, high school and college so we learn about angles. So if you put both of your straps at the top of your head, you will not get that good pull against the top and bottom of your face. The KN95 respirators, and this is one example, and I, I hope you can see it. These straps are at the same place on the, on the side of this um, respirator, but they slide real easily through. So I can you know, try to adjust it uh, on my face. It makes it really comfortable for me, but it doesn't make a tight fit. Other KN95s have ear loops that just fit very comfortably around your ear, but you'll see that you have gaps at the top and the bottom of your respirator. So it really doesn't act as a high filtration device, respiratory protection device. That's why we're trying to make sure that you have N95 respirators because those then have a fit factor that has been validated, that has been verified. So when you're struggling to do fit testing for a KN95, they won't pass. And we have been telling people that have companies that are providing fit testing, if they are sending people with KN95s and everybody's passing fit testing, the company is not um, honest because you literally cannot fit test those um, items. Um, uh, NIOSH has told us that we do not require fit testing for KN95s. So if that is all that you have, we do not fit test for those because they are not part of the fit test requirement process. So I've asked for a letter actually from NIOSH stating that, um, and I'm in there, I've been in their queue for a month um, and have not yet been able to get that. But um, just to kind of let you know, we aren't, you can't fit test for those, um, they, they just won't pass. So the better approach is to say, all right, if this is what is available, what do I need to do to work with my personnel so that they can use these the most effectively? So I think in these situations where I have something that I can't fit test, I'm gonna help my staff make sure that they adjust this so it, it is as tight around their face as possible. That may mean that we've got to figure out how we um, how we adjust this? Do we have to have an extra loop or a knot in the side of some of our our rest, our uh, our straps? But either way, we want it to fit as snugly as it can when it is being used as a respirator. So I want to make sure that we have that caveat. If you are going in and out of patient rooms, you need to have a mask. If you are going to be involved with patients where there is an aerosol generating procedure or that person is coughing and has been identified as a COVID positive patient, that's when you need to make sure that if you have a respirator, you are wearing it. Okay, is that, did I ramble on and did I lose anybody in that or what, was that clear? The bottom line is COVID positive patient in 95 if you have those. If you, if you don't have them, we are wearing what we, what we can wear but a KN95 is essentially a thick mask. And that's, uh, that's, that's all it is. And that's why the fit testing is not required. Any questions about that? Can you, can you show us that mask one more time? I'm trying to show a coworker that mask. Will you hold it up again? Can you show the strings yeah. on it for me? But yeah, so sorry. this may be, this is actually a counterfeit, um, uh, a counterfeit, uh, let me show this to you. I don't know if you can see it, but this is one of the brands that if you go to the NIOSH website, it will give you a list of brands that are counterfeit. 
So these just had somebody, you know, stamp on the outside NIOSH and it gives a number, but that number is not even a NIOSH number. Um, but I can show you, let me grab one and I'll show you the package it came, it came in. Hold on a second. I'm like a stockpile for counterfeit items. So it came in a, in a, in a little wrapped item like a package like this. And it's made by, it, it's got, it's made by SSI. And so this is on the list of, um, it's not a real respirator. This, this actually is a real respirator. So when I talk about the straps, you can see that these straps can be adjusted. So if I put this on and I'll show you, we always tell people to put it on, put your chin in first, and then you pull one strap that's going to go behind your head and the other strap behind your head. So you kind of have to get, look at these, these straps and then figure out which one is gonna go behind my head and which one is gonna go over my head. Some are easier to put on uh, than others. Some of these have been in part of a stockpile for a long time. And I think uh, in Louisville, they've been stored in the mega cavern underneath the zoo. And they've tried to keep them in temperature control. But many of the, um, I think every hospital has had a truck, like a trailer, and it's sat out in the sun. And you know, if you keep rubber out in the sun, it gets becomes real brittle. So some of the straps may not um, be as uh, reliable, but to put this mask on, and if you're somebody like me where you may have an extra chin, you know, over time, I, I'm nutritionally advantaged. I don't like to call myself fat, but nutritionally advantaged. So I've got me an extra little chin. Well, I got to make sure all my chins are tucked in. So tuck your chin in the bottom, pull both straps over your head. One goes behind your head and one goes on top of your head. So let me see if I can... I can uh, do this here. Okay. So you can see when I've got these straps, the angles will pull that so it's really snug on my face and it's tight. Okay. It should be tight. You adjust your nose piece, make sure all your chins are in, and then you're good to go. One strap behind your head, one strap more on the top of your head. Okay. Just for all of those angles. Okay. All right, that's how a respirator should fit. All right, very snugly against your face. Now, some of the smaller the respirators that are paper respirators and not molded, this is called a molded respirator. The paper ones like the uh, Kimberly Clark that looks like a duck, it's called a duck bill when you put it on. I love those, those are excellent, but you have to make sure they're the right size and you have to make sure that as part of your use of a respirator, your, your personnel know that they should always do a fit check and a fit, not a fit test, a fit check. That means when I put my respirator on, I do a quick inhale, exhale. And I make sure then that, that as that, as I do an inhale, uh, that mask is actually moving. That's showing that as I inhale, I'm pulling the air in through that, that respirator and not around the respirator. Okay, that's the most important thing that you can do. Even if you have fit tested, every person should always check their own fit at the start of the, the use of that respirator. Okay, all right, any other questions? I know I'm taking up too much time going through, but I think these are some important um, uh, areas of, of discussion. Any questions about respirators? Okay, all right. Does your facility have a policy that restricts personnel from gathering during breaks and meals? Do you guys yeah. have a? We, I know my facility is very strict about it. Um, and you guys can give me some direction if you want to, because I'm trying to look for ideas as the HR, you know, trying to, you know, uh, I guess trying to regulate my employees. Um, we do not have a large break room 
or a large conference room. Uh, we do have a fairly large dining room, so we do eat, they do eat in there, um, or they try to come in small groups into the conference room or the break room. But if anybody else has any ideas or you have any policies that you're implementing, we have X's on the floor marking six foot social distancing and our members of our staff are not allowed to wear any, like they have to wear their mask at all times on the floor in direct care. Managers have to wear them unless they're alone in their offices. Um, but, and we also, we have, they each have assigned goggles they wear. Um, so if you guys have any ideas about that, I know I personally would like, because I know it's hard um, to regulate that. Mm -hmm. Right. What what ideas or what are others of you doing? I see Cindy. I mean, we're about the same like she is. I mean, we just try to encourage them to not all go on break at once, try to sign out the breaks and have, you know, one or two go on breaks. We have an outside area. So we've in-serviced them. We have a picnic table. They're used to, you know, gathering around that picnic table and smoking. So, you know, we've in-serviced them that, you know, they have to be still six feet apart when they're outside, still have their mask on when they're talking. Um, I mean, it's, you know, basically hard. All you got to do is just keep, only thing we can do is just keep in-service them and teaching them, you know, that they have to do this at all times, no matter what on break or not on break. Okay. So, you know, there's a, there's a big um, process in, um, in the quality world. Uh, and I don't know, Laura, if you have anything that you want to add about this, but human factors engineering is important. And the notion of that is let's make it hard for people to do the wrong thing and easy to do the right thing. So human factors engineering, that's one of the, the ideas about putting um, partitions up so that you are actually causing that physical separation of people that may have to have a desk and, and look at each other. Laura, do you have any, any thoughts about, uh, about incorporating human factors engineering into some of these um, initiatives? Yes, thank you. Um, and we also call them forcing functions. So you force people to do the right thing. For the break rooms, uh, we heard a good suggestion uh, in a, on a previous, uh, from a previous cohort, and that was just to put one chair in the break room. And that's an example of that forcing function. It just signals, you know, only one person can be in here at a time. Um, and so, so I th thought that was a good idea. Um, we did talk about <clears throat> keeping the door open if possible. Um, so that there's a visual awareness of who's in the break room. Not everybody can keep the door open. But uh, do any of you have any ideas uh, like like that? I mean, like the 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 X's um, that Arizona described are really good. Um, but I thought the one chair was a, a good example of, of what Ruth was talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Cindy had mentioned they encourage uh, staff to have lunch and breaks in their car. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's uh, another, uh, another option. They keeping in mind, what, what are we going to do as the weather gets cooler? That if, if staff had gone, have gone outside, that may become more problematic. So you'll have people staying in more if you've had doors or, or windows with, with screens that you've had open to, to increase the airflow that may change in the in the as the weather gets colder so um you know thinking how are we going to adapt with some of that as we as we make those changes all right the, uh, the classic example of a forcing function and you guys can maybe think if this is if there's a translation for this but it you know in your world but it's in the airplane bathrooms so that you uh, the the light in the bathroom won't go on until you lock the door and that's how you turn on the light and then your door is locked you know so nobody would would walk in on you in there that's a forcing function but uh the the, the there was somebody on the call earlier who said that the residents cannot participate in activities if they're not wearing a mask and that's you know that's a that's a bit of a forcing function you know if they want to participate then they have to wear a mask um, it'd be neat if, you know, 
and then this is, you know, in brainstorming, like one of the things I was going to suggest um, a little bit later, but it relates to uh, the residents wearing masks um, and how a team of you all can get together and brainstorm. You've probably heard that term uh, before, but it is a QI method, you know, where the team gets together and says, okay, we're going to come up with like a bunch of wild ideas about how to solve this problem. And right now, you know, for the next 10 minutes, we're going to brainstorm and nobody's going to criticize anybody's idea. And, and you can even say things that are wild and crazy as possible, because sometimes out of those ideas comes something really possible, you know, so I thought of a wild idea when Ruth asked, you know, what are the four, you know, if you couldn't open the patient, the resident's room, you know, until they were wearing a mask, you know, if it just wasn't possible, you know, I mean, that's not really feasible, but is there anything like that, you know, so um, I, um, I'll just take this moment to, you know, just to get, to give Ruth a breather to, to say about the, um, the question of uh, residents wearing masks when uh, a staffer is in the room. You know, a lot of you, we determined, you know, on this call have not figured that out yet, have not been able to make that happen reliably. You know, and again, this, there's that concept of having a reliable process. And so I was gonna suggest that uh, for those of you, you know, who that does not happen 100% of the time, if you would in the coming week get together with a couple of your coworkers and say, let's brainstorm how we can make this happen more often. Like you can even, even try to do a pre-test and a post-test, you know, to see if your ideas are making a difference. But take a moment and brainstorm with each other. What could we do? I really liked earlier when um, you all were starting to come up with possible things to do that we already got on the list. You know, like I loved when Dr. Laura Martin said that some of her patients have signs in their room that ask, you know, please ask me to put on my mask. I would love it if you could take a picture of that next time you see it and share that with us, because that's something, you know, we could make for the patient, you know, for the residents and they might enjoy, you know, putting up that sign, you know, and, uh, and then getting them involved maybe even getting the residents involved, you know, in discussing how could we make this happen more. You know, they might have some ideas, the ones that are more on board with it and understand the importance of it. And, you know, it struck me that another possible argument for them is not only that it keeps them safe and it keeps the staff person safe, but it keeps everybody in the facility safe. And maybe they would have that sense of, you know, community and wanting to help the whole community stay safe. You know, so I, I like that idea and maybe an assignment, you know, for the coming week to brainstorm some ideas and try some things and see if you can improve. You know, even if you improve one, with one patient and one staff person, you know, in the coming week, sorry, resident, I'm um, used to working in the hospital world. You know, that might make a difference. And it certainly could make a difference, could save lives just to change change it with one resident. Thank you, Laura. Hey, Ruth, in the interest of time, since we've talked a lot about respirators already, is it okay with you if we move forward to the, the, the QI questions to ask so that we still have time for our case please study? Do. Please okay. do. Okay. All righty. Let me do that. And then I'm going to do this and that and that. All right. Um, Laura, since you have the mic, so to speak, you want to go ahead and walk us through the questions. Okay. Well, this is uh, a set of questions that, you know, came up earlier uh, that you all can consider to make sure that your policies are in place. And I'll read them, you know, real quick because they may not even be, uh, you know, time essential and current for you all. But here are the kinds of things that you can ask. Do you have measures for obtaining adequate supply for at least two weeks? Do you have a contingency plan for shortages? Have you trained your staff in, in proper you know, selection, donning and doffing? Is PPE available outside the patient, the resident room? Are trash receptacles in strategic locations near the exit of resident rooms? Um, if COVID-19 is in the building, are staff wearing PPE for care of all residents? Uh, do residents wear face masks when they leave the room? Are all employees wearing 
face masks in the facility. So if you, we want to make sure, you know, all of this is in place and that everyone knows the policy and, and how to implement them. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Um, and if you guys have continued questions about these, by all means, drop them in the chat or unmute and uh, go ahead and feel free to, to ask those out loud. But um, for now, we're going to transition into the case study. So um, Anna, did you want to walk us through this? Sure, I will quickly read the case study and, and let's think while we read the case study about how uh, this kind of stuff could apply to your space. So Mrs. Smith is an 83 year old woman with moderate Alzheimer's disease who lives in a memory care unit at a facility where activities have been reduced. She needs dental care and as she can at times become frustrated and has a history of depression and anxiety. The limited mobility due to lack of activities has impacted her negatively. She's hard of hearing. She regularly gets scared of the staff wearing PPE, and she cannot read their lips to understand what they are saying and why things are so different. June is one of the nursing assistants assigned to care for Mrs. Smith along with 31 other residents. June ate her lunch while feeding Mrs. Smith and didn't have her own protective gloves or a gown as required in such situations. And her mask was below her chin so she could eat her food. It was easier this way. She could explain better to Mrs. Smith what to do. June later walked into the room of another resident in the same unit of out eye protection, such as goggles. She helped change the resident's soiled briefs, then removed the glass, revealing a second layer of gloves. She then fed the resident without washing her hands. A week later, 38 residents and 10 staffers, including June, tested positive for COVID-19. Five residents died as a result of being infected. June had lunch in the employee break room of seven other employees and watched TV during a 30 minute break last week. This is a regular occurrence and staff wear no PPE in a break room altogether. Five of the staff members have now been confirmed positive for COVID and are out of work without pay. So what are your thoughts about uh, this case study? There are some questions in the, uh, that you can see there. Tell us what you think. Is this something that happens in your space? Any questions for Ruth related to some of this? Or to Laura, both Laura's? So at present, what, what, do you, what is your biggest problem? your biggest challenge with personal protective equipment at this point? Uh, for us at Twin Rivers, it's wearing face masks properly. Wearing them so properly? Not being down, yeah, not being, you know, under the nose, things like that, that we have to keep reminding people of. Uh, that's our that's our biggest challenge. We're, we're lucky we have a huge dining room uh, and the staff are able to sit at, you know, we have, 12, 13 tables in there and they're each able to sit at a table. So that's not a problem uh, for us. Uh, you know, we, we, we have enough PPE. So, I mean, we're, we're able to do these things. Of course, we've always encouraged or not encouraged, it's a rule. Uh, they cannot eat while they're in the room feeding someone else. That is a huge, huge no-no. Even, even, even without COVID. So, you know, that's, we've, We've gotten that out of our system uh, through education and individual education, things like that. So our biggest problem with PPE is just wearing the mask properly. And, and you know, as they talk, they fall down, you know, they're constantly trying to readjust and just showing them how to readjust it properly with the strings, not pulling on the mask, things like that. So that's our biggest challenge. Okay. And our residents do not wear a mask in the room and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that, but Oh, wow. It's going to be a fun day trying to get our residents, you know, with the mental illness and the, and the uh, fiercely independent residents that we have. So they do a pretty good job of wearing them in the hall. So. Well, Ruth, I mean, just on that point, you're, you're not saying they have to wear a mask in the room all the time, right? It's just when they... Just during the interaction, right. Just no, and they're not, they're not even, yeah. But the, our, our residents are not wearing masks during the interaction. It, it is, we're, it's everything we can do to get them to wear them in the hall. Yeah. Uh, you know, now our employees are 100% wearing masks all the time. Uh, and I do understand where you guys are coming from. Two people wearing masks reduces that greatly. Uh, 
you know, and it's something we can strive towards, but I, in our building, it's going to be extremely challenging uh, yeah. because it's, it's hard enough getting them to wear, you know, we deal with a lot of mental health and I'm sure other buildings do too. Um, so it's going to be, a, it's going to be a huge challenge, but it, it's something for us to look at. So I appreciate that being brought up. What yeah, about, um, uh, what about um, if, if you have COVID positive patients that you know they're COVID, COVID positive, do, do you require the, re the resident to wear a mask? Uh, we, we have not, but we haven't, we've, we've only had two and they were sent out uh, promptly. Yeah, yeah. So, but There's, that is, that, and like I said, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, can't force it. Yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you, you know, for, all we thank could, you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, one, one uh, another QI concept is segmenting the population. So you could even prioritize those, uh, you know, a, a patient who would be COVID positive and see if you can figure out a way to have that resident wear the mask. I think we would have more success in, in having a positive. I, I think we would have more success with that resident. And I think they'd be a little more understanding of wearing a mask during interactions. So I, I, I think we wouldn't have that problem as much. Uh, you know, when when our residents, you know, they'll they'll fight and fight and fight, and and then when they're faced with, oh, okay, it's real, yeah, I'll put a mask on, yeah, I'll do this, you know. So much much like most Americans. So I mean, it, it's they're not they're not any different than you know most Americans. So uh, you know, we're very independent, but and then when it gets real, then we go, oh, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> so. Or you may, as, as Laura was mentioning, that segmenting, you may even say, you know, if you have a resident that is, that is exhibiting any symptoms, so if you have any resident that is coughing, it may not be COVID, you know, it may be there are many other reasons that, that residents develop cough, uh, but if there are those symptoms, then if they're able to do that, just recognizing that, you know, with uh, symptoms of a respiratory infection, that may be more difficult for them just physiologically to be able to put a mask over their face. If they're already coughing, that's showing some type of potential respiratory compromise, and it may make it more difficult for them. At a more, they may have more of a sense of not being able to breathe well. Um, so, you know, how do we balance that? I think that's you know one of our challenges. Um, definitely, definitely. So, so uh, you already have in place then um, that that your uh, personnel are wearing a mask and not a cloth face covering, right? That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. And we're also wearing uh, face shields or goggles, so. Perfect, perfect. And that none of your um, respirators are those that have a, an exhalation valve, right? That is correct. That is perfect. correct. Perfect, perfect. So we, I think early we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of the, the um, respirators with those valves and we know that those represent a a risk, the wearer then all of their expired air is coming directly out of that exhaust valve. Um, so that that is um, a transmission uh, risk. So when you mentioned um, uh, helping them realize how to wear their masks, uh, we're, we're seeing, and I think several, an, another group uh, mentioned this, that people seem inclined that if they have to cough, they pull their mask down. Or if they have to sneeze, they pull their mask down. We would want to tell people, no, really, we, we want you to contain all that, that I know nobody likes to wear a mask and they just coughed or sneezed in, uh, but we would rather them contain that and then change their mask uh, if they don't want to continue to, to wear that. I know it's sort of like wearing your own used Kleenex, um, but we don't want them to remove their mask then to cough or sneeze into the environment. So, you know, having some of those reviews about, you know, what is uh, important mask wearing um, uh, strategies or some things to remember about wearing a mask, just putting those pieces of information down uh, together, I think are important. And then as we uh, get closer to Thanksgiving, uh, beginning now to talk about with your, um, with your personnel, what are going to be some important things to remember as they undoubtedly will have family gatherings. Uh, there's no way to make, to reasonably say don't get together around Thanksgiving. Um, in addition to some of the suggestions that are coming out from states, 
um, it would be helpful for you to also be giving those messages and making it realistic and as, uh, as personal as you can um, to, your, to your staff because we know people are gonna be coming back from uh, Thanksgiving and they're going to be ill and you're going to be identifying this. So we expect then to see another surge um, after the holidays simply because people will be uh, together again. So another reason to be thinking about how do we you know, reinforce mask use by everybody as often as we can, just in response to know what we know we will see after uh, Thanksgiving. Cindy so, Cobb, you had a comment about you have a high risk area that's dedicated to residents with symptoms. You wanna take a couple uh, seconds and, and kind of brief us on that? We have um, one, we have five different halls in our building and one hall is dedicated for residents who have any type of, um, if, if they have developed any type of symptom that could be related to COVID, we immediately move them to that hall. Um, we go ahead and do uh, COVID testing at that point and then they will stay there for 14 days um, with the last three of those days being symptom free. Uh, and then they can go back to their their home or their their room um, after they have after they have been symptom free. And we do that with our all of our new admissions go to that hall. Um, we keep our dialysis residents on that hall. And then again, any resident who has any type of symptom that could uh, be linked to COVID, they go to that hall until they're symptom free. Perfect. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, I know Arizona had a great comment here about the uh, the Hero at Home project. Um, but I do want to get to this other question before we run out of time. Uh, is can we please address dealing with the effects of COVID on the residents as in their physical health is declining due to the isolation and are now giving up? We are encouraging fluids and food, et cetera, but even if they don't get the virus, they are dying from giving up. Yeah. We know this is an unfortunate reality and uh, as part of, of COVID that this separation is killing our patients uh, almost at the rate that COVID-19 is. Um, and I think this is, you know, again, underscores the importance of us doing everything we can now to get in front of this, um, uh, in front of this uh, virus um, because our, our residents can't tolerate this social isolation. Um, uh, and I think it's a, a horrible reality. And I think probably why the, the uh, aging population is, you know, gonna be able to muscle their way in front of everybody else for any type of vaccine um, or any of the, you know, the antibodies um, that are, that we hope are gonna be available very soon. Yeah. I, I just wanna add a comment to that. And that is that, um, you know, at the Traeger Institute, we've been acutely aware of, of the issue that you just raised that people are giving up. And um, we have a, a group of mental health providers, students that um, can come in and, and not come in necessarily because you, you may be locked down, but uh, to provide you all with ideas on what you can do. We can also do support groups for you remotely. We can bring in all kinds of tools. So if there's anyone who is struggling with this kind of stuff on, on the patient who's really struggling from a mental health perspective, please um, reach out to me personally and uh, we will see if we can bring resources to you. And I just want to say, I just want to add, just as a medical director who's been through outbreaks and watched a lot of my patients really decline during this, and I would want to encourage you all to empower your teams at your facilities um, to really do what you all do all the time, which is that person-centered care, uh, because we have to look at each person who's in front of us. And it's really hard because the one size fits all, unfortunately, doesn't work. And some people, when we have to think outside the box of what we can do to engage those people and try to meet those ones who are declining and how we reach out to them or get them those compassionate visits to try because there is that compassionate visit clause that's allowed for those kinds of residents situations. So you have to work through it, but really would encourage you all to empower your staff and the team members because sometimes it may be the aide or the dietary person or the chaplain who may come up with the idea of what might work for that person. So I just would encourage you and then definitely reach out to Traeger to see if they can help as well. Yeah, and, and, and I want to give a shout out to 
Arizona with what she said about the activities director who has done a great job in their facility to establish a daily routine full of activities, outdoor visits, window visits, Zoom calls. That's great. That's exactly the kind of stuff we need to do. And uh, if you need ideas for that, you know, let us know as well. Yeah. Uh, this is Barbara. I'm the director of community engagement at Traeger Institute, and uh, there, and it's different in every community. I know and understand that, but there are some things that have been done uh, with partnering with community groups uh, in Louisville. We have H Friendly Louisville. I do know it exists in uh, H Friendly uh, groups exist in a few other cities in the state, but uh, they have literally done some things uh, by connecting to uh, nursing homes, including parades, et cetera. There are some other community groups, uh, including one I'm really familiar with, who's uh, actually uh, gotten kids to, uh, you know, write letters, to send cards, to uh, create like a pen pal type activity for your residents who are able to write uh, and send letters, et cetera. So there, there may be some things that you can do with community groups. Uh, to keep your residents connected, engaged, involved, and, and like, you know, war waiting for that next card to come, et cetera. Uh, that expectation and anticipation is very uh, rewarding and uh, engaging. So uh, you can also email me if uh, you want to learn a little bit more about what might be going on in your community. Have partners, we have partners all across the state. Uh, so uh, I'll put my email address in the chat as well. Awesome. Thank you, Barbara. All right, folks, we are we are at the end. Of, we're actually a little bit past the end of our time together. Um, so I do want to thank you all for your time and this uh, really good discussion today. There's the end of session poll. Please make sure you take that before you log out. Um, so that way we can again, make sure that we're capturing attendance. So some folks may have joined late and didn't take a poll at the beginning. Um, you know, maybe we didn't drop everybody's name in the chat. So this is just the third way for us to capture um, your attendance today. So again, we want everybody to get credit, full credit, so that you get the full benefits from being part of this, uh, this project that we're doing here. So um, additional questions, if you have them, um, shoot them to us. Um, you've got some email addresses there in the chat. Um, we encourage that. Uh, and after you finish your poll, you're free to sign out. Uh, we thank you again very much for your time. We thank Ruth and Anna and Laura uh, for, for being part of this discussion. And we appreciate all that you are doing. So stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next Wednesday. Thank you, folks. Hey, hey, David, I have a quick question for you. Yes. Okay, so um, just kind of asking, and you may not have any ideas towards this, but like one of the reasons that, um, like one of the big reasons I'm on this call is because I do employee activities and things like that um, and try to, and I also do our training for our orientation. Um, so one of my questions is, is right now we're trying to implement, I guess you could say more creative ways to encourage people to take practices inside the building and outside the building to encourage uh, good PPE practice. So one of the things we've done is, I, I don't know if you guys have ever went to those baby showers where they play the game, or if you say the word baby, they take a paper or take your like clothespin. Well, we implemented it with PPE. So if someone isn't properly wearing PPE, or if you see someone, you know, eating in a non-designated area or something, they take that from you. Um, so it's, it's become a competition for our employees to kind of uh, motivate each other to wear PPE correctly um, and hold each other accountable. Other than that, because we've been playing that for about a month and a half now, um, do you guys have any ideas that your centers have implemented to, to encourage them to do better or to take initiative? Laura, any ideas from the, from the center point? Barbara from Community Engagement. Hmm. So just as medical director, I can tell you it's a quite a challenge. I think frequent education. I, I like that you're making it fun. I think that's a really creative idea um, to do the 
the paperclip idea, um, kind of like the safety pin game. Um, I think a lot of it's that culture of where everybody's working together with the same goal and just that it's okay to say, oh, you know, you, your mask slipped down a little bit to make it okay. Because sometimes it seems like we're criticizing other people. And I think that gets to be you know, everybody's tired. I get it. And so just that kind of that culture of like, hey, we're all in this together. We're here. We want to remind each other. We want to support that. And that I think it always helps to focus back on the, the residents that you have, because, you know, most of your staff, um, you know, really, really care about the people that live there, the people that they take care of. And, you know, for some people, it's like extended family. And so just to, to keep bringing the focus back, but I think creating that culture where it's okay to just say, hey, you, you know, you're, you're slipping or, and, and just that it's okay. And we're not going to go report you to the supervisor. And, you know, I think, I think that's really important, um, for fun and like a more creative idea. I'd love to hear some, um, because, you know, I, I can tell you, I don't know if I'm the most creative at all. So I'm always open to hearing those, that kind of things. And the beauty about 2020 and everything else that's come along this year is that we're seeing, we can rewrite the script any way we want. So, you know, it used to be like somebody would say there's no dumb questions. Well, yeah, sometimes there were. I think all that's out the door and anything is is game. Uh, so others, um, anybody else getting out, uh, gets great ways to engage, supports uh, their, their staff, their team. Well, if anyone comes up with any, <laughs> please, um, I can put my email in the, in the chat box, but um, I'm new to long-term care. I just started in, um, in June, so this is a new breed for me, um, but I know personally, you know, retention for employees is, is really low for us right now because, I mean, I have nurses leaving nursing because of COVID. Um, I know personally, all the women in my family are nurses and my grandmother is retiring early um, because of COVID. So, you know, I'm trying to make it fun. I know it's not always a fun conversation. Sometimes right. it has to be a little more strict, but if you guys have any ideas, I just put my email in there. Please let me know because I try to be a fun reminder. In my I have one idea. I have one idea. And um, since you like the games, is you could um, count the number of days that you all are COVID free, you know, and you could say, um, you know, and celebrate that. Uh, so everybody, you know, will know how to keep everybody COVID free, but you could have a big sign, like a counter, you know, like one of those, you know, even one of those uh, mm -hmm. charity thing, fundraising things, you know, like yeah. a thermometer. And you could say, you know, okay, we're gonna get to a hundred. And when we get to a hundred, then uh, we're gonna, you know, have a pizza party or something, you know, mm -hmm. so that everybody's in it together, and and you know, maybe uh, then the reminders of coworkers will be in the spirit of, you know, getting to a hundred. Well, I know um, I mentioned in the in the chat box, and David, you mentioned that about the hero at home. So I know not everyone in this call is from Genesis Healthcare, um, but we have the Hero at Home initiative, and that's kind of our plan. Um, Laura with that I mean we don't have the counter I would love to implement that that's a great idea uh, hero at home if you guys aren't really familiar with that um, it's just kind of an implementation that we do in our centers not all centers participate but um, I like the idea of we encourage families to wear masks even in their home with large groups for Thanksgiving for Christmas for birthdays um, and then out in the public and then they will send me pictures on my personal phone or through my email or you know through Facebook chat or something like that and they send me pictures of them with their family and their mask on in public and on vacation we send it to our corporate headquarters and they post it all over the social medias um, our personal Facebook they post it on that they post it on the court I know we actually just had employees posted to the corporate site um, yesterday so that's, that's you know good. nationwide so um, for Thanksgiving you know we were talking about earlier it's a big deal it's a it's a big issue um, I know personally I have family who don't believe in COVID I think we all know people like that um, and they don't want to wear the mask. But of course, I try to because I'm in healthcare. But um, like I said, if you guys come up with any ideas, especially around the holiday seasons, my email's in the chat. And I'm always looking for more ways to encourage them to follow the rules. So, um, but just let me know. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Arizona. And for the Thanks, folks remaining everyone. on the call, if, again, reminder, once you've completed the poll, you're free to log out unless you have some other questions or follow up. <laughs> Sharon Davis had a question about, are we getting CEUs? Oh, okay, it was answered. Yeah, I answered, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I answered it, yeah. yep. 
I'm thinking with that uh, philanthropy thermometer idea, once you get to 100, you want to keep going. So maybe like make the next, you know, the next level a better, a better gift, a better surprise. <laughs> so you keep, keep staying free of COVID. I, uh, I probably should have asked Arizona, I, I'll email her to uh, ask a clarifying question, but I'm, I'm wondering if she was also alluding, because she talked about Thanksgiving a lot um, and people getting with their families, but if she was alluding to um, staff um, also wearing their mask or following guidelines when they're in the community outside of outside of the nursing facility. I don't know if that's what she was alluding to or not, but I'll ask her a clarifying question on that. That's that's even harder than in the nursing facility. <laughs> Especially Jennifer, Stephanie, uh, Tamara, did y'all have anything you wanted to add or ask? Because if not, you're you're free to log off. No, I'm just scared I'm gonna miss something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wanna hang out with you guys. <laughs> Love that. Thank you. <laughs> it's just power, people. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, All right. All right. Well, thank you, lady. Thanks thank you. Well. Thank you. <laughs> oh, she's great. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I don't know. What, was the, what was the poll uh, results on that one? Let's see here. Do you get to keep these? Are you filing these results? Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah you must be because you're. Some and a lot. Yeah, all good. Right. Mm -hmm. They're all logged out. Okay.